So welcome everyone to Humanities Talk Session 6 of the 7th Symposium of Rising Scholars here at Polygens. My name is Jin, I'm one of the founders of Polygens and a big humanist at heart, so I'm super excited to be moderating this session. Um, the goal of the symposium, as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, is to celebrate and showcase the hard work of all of our Polygen scholars, um, all of whom have worked so hard over the past couple of months or over the past year on their projects. Today, we actually have three number three students presenting on a variety of topics, um, and a fellow member of my team will be scoring each student's presentations, either live or asynchronously, depending on whether they can join us right now, which will help us determine all the prize winners after the event. Um, if you have any questions about, um, about the presentations, please type them in the Q&A, um, and we will have time at the end of each person's presentation to answer your questions. And today we have three presenters. We have Arnav Padwartan, Pedro Silva, and Thu Vu. Um, and they're presenting on a variety of different topics, including creating interest in STEM, prison systems, and much more. And so um, let's get started. Since we, and since we only have three student presenters, we can probably spend a little bit more time in the Q&A session um, and yeah, have more critical discussions, which is great. So our first presenter is Arnav Pradvartan. I'm really excited to welcome you. And so for myself, I'll, I'll turn off my camera and if Pedro, you can turn off your camera too um, while um, Arnav is presenting. And then I'll turn my video back on at one when you have one minute left um, so that you kind of have a visual cue to know that you have one minute left. Um, does that sound good? Great, so welcome Arnav, um, ready when you are. Hey, hi everyone. My name is Arna Pedwarthan, and today I'll be presenting to you, presenting to you my project about creating interest in STEM. So I'm a senior at Tenafly High School in New Jersey, and I've always had a passion for education, whether that be through learning myself or through teaching others. I believe education to be the most valuable asset in people's lives, so I wanted to see if there was a way to improve it. For my project, I wanted to examine why there are so few women as compared to men in STEM fields. To do this, I developed a survey based off my research question, which reads as follows. How do male versus female college students describe their experiences in their high school STEM classes? Further, do they believe that their STEM learning experiences help develop their interest in pursuing more advanced STEM studies? The experiences of male versus female students will be examined. So as many of you may know, there is a large disparity between men and women in STEM, mostly in fields including math. For example, only 13% and 18% of engineers and computer scientists respectively are women, as you can see in the graph on the left. There are many causes for this, with the most obvious answer being ongoing stereotypes. A more interesting intermediate result, of, however, of these ongoing stereotypes is a decrease in the confidence of women. Numerous studies have shown that even when test results are equal, women still experience greater anxiety. An important part of these issues is the role of teachers. When teachers have lower confidence in students, the students in turn tend to have lower confidence in themselves. So on the, on the graph on the left over here, you can see how females are more likely to experience discrimination in STEM. And on the right, it shows how females are more likely to drop out of STEM subjects due to their uh, confidence and anxiety issues in the field. So the survey I used was developed using survey questions from two prior relevant surveys, as well as some original questions, and was designed for American college students aged 18 or older. The questions used either a five point or a six point Likert scale. The instrument I used for it was Google Forms. And in order to test reliability for the questions, I ran a Cronbach alpha test on the original questions, and they all had an alpha value of above 0 0.7, as you can see on the left over there. Um, to find participants, they were randomly obtained through college Facebook groups, and all of them were students currently majoring in STEM fields. To find the results of my survey, I used t-test as well as correlation to see the, diff to see the significance of the answers. The data of the survey matched previous studies in that women had lower levels of confidence, and this is connected to the fact that women also received less support from teachers, such as them giving additional problems more often to men. 
An additional difference was based off of income. Teachers of lower income students were less avail available to meet out of class, cared less of their success, and made students feel more nervous, and in general, were just less involved as compared to those of higher income students. So, so from the survey, teachers were listed as the second most influential group of people for developing STEM interest. They play a, an important role in encouraging further interest in the field. For example, there was a strong correlation between teachers recommending students to STEM extracurriculars and then their participation in one. So in conclusion, although the issue is improving, women are still not receiving enough support to develop interest in STEM, which is what is resulting in the ongoing gender disparity in the field. In order to remedy this, teachers should be given more equivalent amounts of support towards women through ways such as meeting outside of class and providing extra material. They should be trained for this in order to properly provide extra support to girls. This will help reduce the confidence issues women experience, which will in turn increase interest in STEM. Studies and surveys similar to mine should be ran in the following years in order to test whether there's change in female interest in STEM, either positive or negative, and then what are the reasons for that. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Amazing. What a relevant and important topic, Arnav. Um, we actually have a couple of questions already flowing in. One is from Veronica. How did you get interested in this topic? I actually yeah, so <laughs> uh, I do a lot of uh, like tutoring in like various places, and I just care a lot about education as well as I'm a big, I'm big into STEM and science. And I feel like there's an issue where so many people in the field are men and not uh, very many of them are women and it doesn't create enough diversity. Totally. Awesome. Um, question from Lucy, how can schools hold teachers to being equitable in their approach to teaching and supporting their students in STEM subjects? Yeah, so this is like a little more of a difficult question as it's not as easy to find a quantitative answer for this, but the best way to do that is just through giving like more resources, like providing extra material, uh, giving extra time outside of class, and just overall this encouragement towards girls. Absolutely. I even remember when 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 I was in high school many moons ago, um, there was like even even in a lot of like side remarks that teachers would make, it's kind of like, oh, girls are sort of definitely humanities arts, and like yeah. It's it's kind of it's so insidious in terms of in, in the minds of teachers and school administrators and therefore in, in, in also students' minds. Um, from Jordan, what's the most interesting you discover the interesting thing that you discovered throughout your research process? Well, I think definitely is it just that women have um, lower confidence in the field because for everything like uh, there's a big uh, common belief that girls are just not as good in STEM as compared to boys. But their test results are almost the same, if at all, women tend to score better. So it's all just outside influ um, issues like confidence and anxiety that are creating the differences in being in the field. Totally. And I, I was mentioning to Arnav um, and Pedro on uh, in our practice session when I was prepping them for, for the presentation that I actually um, recently overcame my own confidence issues and started learning SQL from the data analyst that we recently hired. Um, and it's just, I think so much of it is is psychological and, and um, sort of reinforced by societal norms by the way people talk about STEM and computer science in particular um, and sort of how gender stereotypes are so reinforced by just conversations that happen that like the more I think we can break those boundaries by leading by example or by sort of showing that um, lots of different sort of groups and people can can equally excel if not better right at, at the yes, same time. totally. Yeah. Um, from Peachy, um, please discuss how you're extending your study down in age, maybe to include high school students as well. Yeah. So this study, I did it for college students over the summer. But now that my school year started up again, I was able to get permission from my school to run uh, a very similar survey on my own awesome. uh, students in my high school and my fellow peers. And I would and I would like to find the data on that as I think it'd be very interesting to see how current high school students are also feeling about STEM. 
Amazing. And that also sort of answers Danny, Danny's question about how you continue, how you're thinking about continuing to research this topic. Do you feel like this has influenced the way in which you've interacted with some of your female friends? Um, not necessarily, just because my live in a very uh, great school system where it's very open to all genders. So in that case, I'm very um, privileged in that, where there is a lot of support to both genders. So I wouldn't necessarily say it for my school system. Got it. And I have one last sort of more technical question, which is, I'm not familiar with, with what a t-test is. Can you tell us what that is? Um, so a t-test is just a parametric test to test whether um, the data was, the difference in the data is significant. So basically it just sees the differences in like the answers. And if like the differences are like large, then it's considered significant enough. So that so, so some questions, for example, the t-test would give like a very high value, which would mean that the answers I got were not significant. But when it's a low value, the answers are significant. Got it. So it's like statistical um, significant yes. tests, basically. Cool. Great. I learned something new. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Arnav. If there are any other questions, we, I'm sure we can return to it after Pedro's presentation as well. But for now, thank you. And I'll, I'd like to invite Pedro to turn on his camera um, and to take us through his presentation. Thank you, Arnav. Thank you very much. And I'll do the same thing. I'll come back on at one minute. Um, yeah, and I'll have my video off and I'll be spotlighting you. Gotcha, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Pedro Sova. I'm 17 years old and I'm currently a senior in high school and now living in Miami. I started with Polygens in May of 2022. Now, the central question of my project is how U.S. prisons can be fixed. And I answer this question in the form of a research project. So what inspired me to do this was one story of a man named Khalif Browder. Uh, this was actually a man in New York that at 16 years old was arrested for a robbery that he did not commit. And on top of this, he spent two out of the three years in jail in solitary confinement, which later led him to having severe mental issues and later taking his own life. Now, this deeply impacted me and made me look into the Innocence Project, which then integrated into my passion for law. And since I chose the podcast, I have a huge love for music. I'm quite the audiophile and a love for documentaries and uh, just general information that is presented in a more um, consumable way for people. Now, not only did I use um research database programs like jstor i made a central part of my podcast uh around virtual interviews because i believe that uh working with people who are have direct info or direct work with the prison system would be maybe a bit more uh suitable for the stories that i was telling than just talking about statistics but the statistics that I did use were from notable and current national resources, such as the American Psychological Association and the Bureau of Federal Prisons. Now, a quick overview of my podcast. I go over four overarching ideas from, uh, throughout my project. Uh, first, I talk about prison philosophy and the idea of penology versus rehabilitation. Author and criminologist Mary Storr believed that prisons before the 1950s were focused on penology, which means the study of punishment of crime. The call for greater human rights and better treatment of prisoners in the civil rights movement caused the United States government to change the names of prisons to correction facilities to signify the shift. This was only a name switch, since many of these outdated punishments from this old prison system are still in place. Another thing that I talk about is staffing, and really the underpreparedness of prison guards and the underfunding of medical staff and mental health services in prisons. I also talk about the usage of our $81 billion budget and where this money goes. And it usually goes straight to the prison staff, which really doesn't serve a good purpose in rehabilitating its prisoners. And then I finally talk about prison populations and how we got to this 2 million prisoners uh, population that we have, which is the largest in the world. A specific issue, one of the specific issues that I tackled was solitary confinements. And this really hits home uh, home for me since my story with Khalif Browder. Um, one of the reasons behind its use is really since 54% of the prison population suffers from some form of mental illness, guards just use solitary confinement to avoid conflict and giving aid. Now, on top of this, from a financial perspective, it isn't really that helpful. It costs $78,000 to house people in solitary confinement. 
which is more than twice for normal housing. So really, it's just wasting a ton of our budget on a program that doesn't help with anybody and causes extreme psychological trauma. It causes people who were safe to be reintroduced into society to suffer mental degradation and motivates their return to prison. Now, I talk about how we can fix this. Now, I think believe that the US should look at examples set by other nations, such as prison population comparison, since really even countries with similar populations to the US have almost half the, the prison population. For, for Brazil, for example, they have a population of 800, uh, 200 million and a prison population of 800,000. Now, I also like to talk about prison structures and practices prompted by positive outcomes in other countries. Norway, for example, structures their prisons to feel more like a cabin in the woods. Uh, and what I mean by that is instead of having big um, over, over uh, boarding like prison walls, they actually set up trees around their border, uh, their um, their border, uh, borders of prisons to create a sense of natural beauty. And also the practices that they take in are uh, using music and dance to actually foster a more inclusive community. And on top of this, I talk about prison abolition. Now, what it, prison abolition entails is basically using our $81 billion budget to then fund uh, reintrod reintroduction programs for prisoners and psychological evaluations for a network of professionals fit for handling convicts and anyone that commits a crime. Now, an overarching proposal of my project is that Americans are always thinking about prison. And this is an integral part of the justice system in our country. And it's sensed by all of us in some way or another. But even with this awareness, not many people know what really goes on inside the walls of many prisons across the United States, especially the cruelties inflicted on prisoners. Now, I ask all of you, what can us average US citizens do to counteract this. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pedro. Super important topic, of <laughs> course. Um, all right. Any questions from the audience? Actually, I think the first question that was asked um, to Arnav, actually, I would also love to ask to you, which is, how did you get interested in this topic? Was it like a news story? Was it your meeting with Cliff or was it something else? That's actually a really good question. Um, it was, I watched the movie 13th in one of my uh, classes in school. And then I kind of thought, well, this, I feel like there's some stuff that they're leaving out. Like I just wanted to bring more to the table than just what was presented in that film and, and presented in other forms of media in the United States. Cause really it, it shocked me. And you know, I, I knew plenty about the topic, but I, <laughs> and then, even compared to other people, you know, they knew barely anything. So I thought that this podcast would be the best form to just inform, uh, you know, the average person that doesn't really know anything. Totally. And for everyone's context, 13 is a um, documentary on Netflix, I believe, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is about the U.S. incarceration system and um, criminal justice reform. Well, criminal justice history and then criminal justice reform. Highly recommend. It's really great. Um, from Peachy, do and would social movements like Black Lives Matter, for example, have any impact on prison policies or have they already had impact on prison policies? Um, I certainly think that they do have some impact. Um, I touched on this a little bit in my presentation, but I do talk about this more in um, my actual project. Um, the civil rights movement was actually uh, the first kind of spark for prison reforms in the United States. And I feel like now currently with movements like uh, Black Lives Matter, we're having, we're seeing more of a push toward at least taking away the racial bias of a lot of prisons and making sure that if we still have this bias, at least make it uh, better living conditions for prisoners. Absolutely. Um, I think that's that's so important. And I, I, I was again sharing with, with Pedro and Arna right before, um, right before we started the session that um, when I was in college um, in New Jersey at Princeton, I taught in five different um, correctional facilities around the area. And I think one of the most shocking things that I learned um, is that they, like the technology, the books, the resources that they have access to are like 20 years old. And so the, the, there was just nothing 
that my students and, and I was teaching sort of re-entry interview skills um kind of like a lot of the things that you were talking about in terms of career preparation what happens once they get on parole like how do we help prepare them for that so we uh, a group of Princeton students wrote a curriculum and we essentially like delivered it in in the correctional facilities but like the books they had access to the computer terminals they had access to it felt like we time traveled back like 20 years um and so I think it's just yeah there's there's so much that's wrong with the system in terms of what are um how we're treating our um incarcerated populations um yeah so super super important topic um from veronica do you want to continue the podcast after your um after your polygons project yeah i actually would um maybe not the same topic because i feel like definitely what i've done with polygons has been enough where i i feel like i've covered um a lot of the topic of prison reforms but I definitely love doing some other form of podcast about different issues, like um, actually another issue that I'm really passionate about that kind of led me to talk about prison reforms was actually um, the uh, court system in the United States and how um, definitely there's a lot of issues with the arguments brought up by prosecutors and how a lot of people are just wrongfully convicted because most of the time it's that jurors don't, don't want to put up with long uh, deliberations or judges uh, over overextend their sentences uh, based on race or um, fi uh, financial conditions. It's it's really it's really interesting stuff that I'd love to delve uh, into later on. Yeah, and and I I don't even know what creating a podcast looks like. Like, do you record it on your iPhone or is it like on your computer? Like. Can you give us some yeah. a sneak peek into what that even looks like logistically? Of course. Um, so actually what I do a lot is uh, I edit it all on GarageBand on my computer. Mm. But mm -hmm. a lot of what I do, um, I, watch a lot of, I watch a lot of YouTube when I was younger. So I know that uh, definitely I have a lot of resources from like co uh, copyright free music or uh, my father actually does a lot of live streaming. Uh, so he cool. actually has a microphone that I use for my project. Um, and then for any of my interviews, I actually just um, recorded them on Zoom. And then on Zoom, you can take either the audio file or you can take the, the video file. So I just put my audio, uh, audio file for my presentation uh, into GarageBand. And then I'd edit it around with some of the music and also like messing with all like the weird knobs that they have on yeah, like yeah. to make sure it's the best audio quality but that's some of it and then for actually uploading a podcast on any streaming service or uh youtube is a bit easier because you you can just upload but uh for any streaming service they actually have to have a host which is basically mm -hmm. um a company that is able to put out your um your music or your podcast out into streaming service so Got I, had, it. I had to use one of those. Amazing. Wow. So much sort of additional learning in addition to just about the topic. Which is yeah. cool. um, we had another question come in um, about what your favorite podcast is. That's a good question. Um, I have a few podcasts that I just listen to on the regular, like, you know, just random conversation podcasts from like, uh, you know, like, I, I don't. I, I'm blanking on the names, mm -hmm. but um, one that I really like, at least for um, if you're talking about um, prison reforms or justice reforms, is a podcast called Wrongful Convictions, mm -hmm. which is um, by this, uh, South Florida F South Floridian lawyer uh, named Josh Dubin, and he goes into different topics like um, you know how some of the forensics uh, forensics uh, materials that we use now aren't really um useful for convicting somebody or how they can just easily get the wrong person uh like blood splatter evidence uh doesn't really you know you can't really reproduce blood splatter blood splatters or yeah. um bite mark evidence uh yeah. although it's sometimes effective you know it's it's not the best way to catch them to catch a criminal um and yeah that's really that's that's my favorite for if you're talking about any social justice stuff amazing cool um, and then another question from Danny, what, um, what were some of the reasons that the U.S. has avoided shifting to more modern, better models 
of criminal Actually, a really good question. Um, so at least when I was looking at it, uh, why they don't want to go into, say, something like, um, you know, more inclusive uh, prison communities is that just now with how uh, prisons currently are, it's hard to shift um, away or like and kind of change the minds of people currently in prison just because, um, you know, it's it's like um, you go into school and then all of a sudden, um, you know, say like you started school with no homework and then all of a sudden like you come back uh, the next day and then um, you just have like a mountain of homework and like projects and stuff like that. You just can't easily calibrate to it. Um, and for something like the uh, prison abolition, it's hard to do it just because there's some technicalities that really mess things up. Like say, would you want to abolish prisons and possibly have um, you know, people who committed very high level felonies to just have, you know, a sentence where they uh, visit a psychologist or would you rather them be locked up away so they won't be a danger to society? So that's really, at least for prison abolition, that's one of the big causes why they haven't been able to change anything. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, we actually have some time left and I'd love to invite Arnav to turn on his camera again. And I'd love to hear from both of you, actually. How has this um, project experience changed what you think you might want to study in the future or further projects that you, you might want to pursue or has it influenced that kind of thinking at all? Uh, just a quick thing, this for turning my camera on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, would you be able to turn it on for me? Oh, um... Yes, I can ask to start video. Right, Great, hello. Any reflections on that, Arnav? Like, do you know what you might wanna study in, in college or, or has this influenced, um, has your project on, on interest and, and on sort of stereotypes of, in, in STEM education influenced what you think you might wanna pursue later on in life? Yeah, definitely. I feel like, so I've always had like a passion for education and I think, this project has shown me like some of the flaws in our educational system and like maybe some ways to improve it. And like, I'm, I'm right now I've been wanting a career in like a, an education policy and like education reform and public policy yeah. and mm -hmm. hopefully finding a way to fix further issues. Cool. And how about you, Pedro? Um, so I've actually always wanted to be a lawyer. I just do from like a young age. That was something that I'm interested in. But now, uh, when I'm th getting closer to college, I'm thinking maybe I can work with, um, like, fresh out of law school, I work as a public defender, just because um, I believe that there are a lot of people that are underrepresented in the public defense system, and sometimes, you know, uh, people don't have the privilege of having, you know, like, a great lawyer, so I would really want to work hard for those people, and um, probably later in my career, if I do want to be part of like a private firm or if I start my own private firm, I would like to closely work with um, some organizations like the Innocence Project to basically mm -hmm. aid anybody that, um, you know, is wrongfully convicted or is over convicted, uh, just having like extended prison uh, sentences and trying to reduce that for them so they can live the best life possible. Amazing. I think both of those are, and, and I actually see a lot of um, connections between between both of your your topics, right? Because there's a whole idea of the school to prison pipeline, where the school system completely fails our students and and our learners, and doesn't um, sort of inspire our students enough such that they, you know, etc. And then there's a direct sort of feeder system between schools, especially underfunded public schools, into the incarceration system in the US. And I think those two things must go hand in hand. Obviously we need to fix our, the, the criminal, um, uh, the conviction process, the organization of prisons, the policies around how we treat prisoners and incarcerated people, and then all the way down to how we engage students in schools, especially at risk teens, et cetera, marginalized groups, et cetera. Um, and it's, uh, it's so amazing to see young people like you both um, take an interest to, to these topics. And um, yeah, I feel like our, our society has, has hope um, with people like, like, you, like you two working on projects like these. Um, 
Awesome. Well, we can end a little early since uh, we've had a really long critical discussion on both of these topics. Thank you both. Um, amazing, amazing presentations. And hope to see you guys in other sessions. And be sure to check out our keynote session, which will happen in just a little under half an hour. So thank you both. And thank you to all attendees who asked questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you.